Hey guys, welcome, welcome back to my channel. My name is Mike. You guys are rocking with me on Mike's Intellectual Corner. On today's episode, we are diving into Kings and Generals Aurelian, Emperor of Who Restored the World. Without further ado, we're just going to dive right into it. Like always, let's go. At the height of Rome's period of anarchy during the 3rd century, with the empire on the very brink of total collapse, a group of tough soldier emperors took the throne for themselves and set about restoring what had been lost. One of these formidable men, Aurelian, took the Roman Empire with an iron grip, glued together its crumbling domain, and set the stage for another two centuries of dominance. Welcome to our video on the Restorer of the World. One evening in early September of the year 268, Emperor Gallienus ate supper in his army's camp near Mediolanum, which was under siege. He was there to deal with a treacherous general named Aureolus, but that would not have been all on his mind. Rome was in total crisis. Almost a decade earlier, the empire had been ripped into three pieces by Posthumus's revolt in the west and a withering Sasanian assault in the east. Moreover, Barbarian attacks from across the northern frontier were steadily getting worse. Yeah, damn, they lost their entire freaking uh, Gaul like frontier out there, which, um, if I'm not mistaken, was mainly just used to, as a buffer uh, state between the the all the uh, nomadic barbarians up north. So it just kind of made it so that they were able to get to Rome and all the other really you know important cities a lot faster, which I'm sure is kind of scary, but. In the midst of his meal, Cacropius, one of Gallienus's commanders, brought word that their besieged enemy was readying a sortie. The emperor immediately got to his feet and rushed off to deal with them. Suspecting nothing, Gallienus departed without his personal guard and was quickly beset and killed by assassins from within his own ranks, Cacropius among them. The perpetrators were a group of military commanders from Illyria, who had seen considerable advancement under the now-dead emperor and his father Valerian. One of them was raised to the throne as Claudius II. Also among the conspirators was the subject of our video, Lucius Domitius Aurelianus. He had been born near Serdica on September 9th of either 214 or 215. After joining the army at about the age of 20, he rose through the ranks with astounding success. By 268, Aurelian was in his early 50s and had risen to be a high-ranking officer who was incredibly popular with the troops. He had earned so much renown for bravery and talent that the nickname of Manu ad Ferum, Hand on Sword, became his. Upon taking the Roman throne, Claudius immediately granted Aurelian a high cavalry command and effectively made him his right-hand man. Together, they took up where Gallienus left off. After quickly executing Aureolus, Claudius II, with Manu ad Ferum at his side. Honestly, it's pretty impressive just for the fact that he even lived, I think, to the, what, the age of 50? Or right now he's 50? It's pretty impressive because I think most um, emperor, most uh, monarchs don't live, or are only living between 50 and 70, so you know, he's already there. Claudius II, with Manu ad Ferum at his side, marched to northern Italy and smashed an Alemanni invasion at Lake Garda. The Romans then turned southeast and advanced into the Balkans, where they managed to defeat a Gothic incursion into the Balkans at Nisus in 269. In both of these triumphs, and whilst mopping up afterwards, Aurelian is said to have played a decisive role. Before Claudius Gothicus Maximus had a chance to celebrate these victories, he died of plague in early 270 triggering yet another power struggle. Quintilius, the late emperor's brother and commander of the troops in Italy, claimed the throne. However, Aurelian, by far the most respected and feared figure in the empire, was simultaneously acclaimed emperor by the legions who were with him. Though Quintilius marshaled his forces at Aquileia, it was not enough. By the time Aurelian and his legions neared Italy, Quintilius's troops had faltered, killed their commander, and confirmed the ascension of Aurelian in September of 270. After deifying his short-lived predecessor, Aurelian marched back to Pannonia, which was being threatened by a Vandal horde. The Emperor first waged a war of attrition against them, 
denying them food and supplies, then smashed the weakened barbarian. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. I feel like uh, being um, living in Rome around this time, or at least being in a soldier, it's just been like straight hell because it's just like non stop fighting, whether it be civil wars or outside. It's just crazy. You know what I'm saying? It's just like you're living to do nothing but secure your borders, essentially. Ends in battle. As soon as Aurelian had repelled that vandal threat, he received word that a united Jathungi Alemanni army had cut through Raetia and was making a beeline for Italy. Rushing to protect the home province, Aurelian's forces caught up with the Germans near Placentia. However, the emperor had not been careful enough, and his exhausted forces were ambushed near the city, resulting in a terrible defeat. Rumours of the humiliation sent Rome itself into a panic, but Aurelian continued on as though nothing had happened recovering from a setback that would have been the end of lesser leaders. The emperor regrouped his army, pursued the invaders south for a second time, and managed to defeat them by pinning their army against the Metaurus River. Despite its losses, the Jathungi Alemanni coalition was still strong, but Aurelian was not willing to allow the enemy to retreat with any Roman spoils. After hard, uncompromising negotiations, and without any further fighting, the barbarians eventually departed empty-handed. Having dealt with all of this external pressure in a mere nine months, Aurelian was also keen to deal with corruption at home. When the corrupt wretch- Yeah, although they're doing pretty good um, securing their borders and stuff, I feel like they're, you can tell that the Roman legion area has like, you know, started to decline a little bit, just a little bit, or not decline, but you know, it's starting to get caught up by the rest of the world, or especially the rest of the rest of the world around them, especially because they've had so long to, you know, get to see what's going on, see how they do stuff, so it's just a... At home, when the corrupt Retinalis, or chief financial minister of the Roman Mint, was confronted about his own underhanded operations, he incited his workers, who feared Aurelian's retribution, to riot. Quintilius sympathizing senators, disruption of the grain supply from now Palmarine-controlled Egypt, and the prior month's invasion scare ratcheted up the tension to the point that the riot turned into small-scale pitched battles. Up to 7,000 were dead by the time Aurelian subdued the city with an iron fist. Ringleaders, including senators, were summarily rounded up and executed. However, along with this punitive solution, the emperor also took measures to prevent future unrest. Beginning in 271, and continuing throughout the rest of his reign, Aurelian attempted to stabilize the coinage and harshly deal with corruption. Most notable of his financial reforms, however, was the strategic relocation of mints away from Rome, instead favoring strategic locations such as Milan and Siscia, where pay could more easily be transported to the armies. It was also clear to Aurelian that Rome's legions and age-old frontier defenses were no longer sufficient to protect the empire's heartland. Individual cities now needed their own fortifications. So the construction of a series of practical, non-aesthetic defensive walls began around Rome, which still remain in the modern day, the Aurelian Walls. Having done this, Aurelian marshaled the legions and moved to meet a Gothic raid in the Balkans. He arrived during the autumn of 271, and quickly pushed them back across the river Danube. Not content to let the barbarians off so easily, the emperor crossed the river into enemy territory, defeated the Goths decisively, and killed their king, Canabaudes. It is possible that this Gothic ruler was the same individual as Cniva, the raider who had defeated Decius at Abritus two decades earlier. In the wake of this last conflict, Aurelian acknowledged that the province of Dacia, which was beyond the Danube frontier, was a pointless exertion of imperial resources and a vulnerable gateway into the empire. To remedy this, Aurelian ordered that all legionary forces and citizens withdraw from the region, effectively abandoning the province. The border was consolidated and shortened on the near side of the river, and a deal was negotiated with a tribe of friendly Germans to settle in the abandoned area as a buffer. It must have been a big step for the conservative Romans to voluntarily and pragmatically admit to this, and it is a sign of Aurelian's adaptable and charismatic nature. With his central section of the empire safe for the time being, 
Aurelian set about mustering one of the greatest armies of the 3rd century throughout the winter months of 271. I wonder, um, like, how, how did that affect all those displaced people, you know what I'm saying? Because that's a lot of people who obviously were born in that region, probably grew up their entire lives in that region, you now have to move to a completely different place. Like, I wonder if the, if he, like, provided, like, the money for everybody to move so that they can buy their housing and all that stuff. 21. It was made up of some of the most veteran military units in the empire, including a core of legions from Pannonia, Raetia, Noricum, and Mysia. To supplement that, Aurelian also brought along some loyal elite Vexillationes which had been with him since the beginning, along with contingents of Dalmatian and Mauritanian cavalry who had proven their worth in the Gothic War. When spring of 272 was near, the emperor ferried his great invading force across the Hellespont and began a steady march across Asia Minor. His ultimate aim was an ambitious one, to reclaim the Eastern Empire from the de facto Palmyrene ruler, Zenobia, who ruled on behalf of her young son, Fabulathus. Yeah, I mean, we know that it happened, because um, obviously these were all land, visiting lands there for what, another, I want to say, it's another like five, six hundred years or so. Who ruled on behalf of her young son, Fabulathus. As Aurelian rode at the head of the main field army, he also sent a naval task force to reclaim Egypt in May. It was possibly, but not certainly, under the command of future Emperor Probus. Very little detail is known of the campaign, but the recently captured Palmyrene possession was weakly held and the Romans recaptured it by midsummer. Meanwhile to the north, Aurelian's advance was almost totally unopposed until he reached the Cappadocian city of Tiana, which refused to admit the emperor. He was so infuriated by this defiance that he pledged not to leave even a dog alive once the city fell to his armies. However, the relatively short siege cooled Aurelian's temper, and he came to realize that leniency would be a more prudent course of action in the long term. To that end. But I mean, I can understand why they were kind of pissed off, because I mean, in their eyes it's probably like, you know, you, you guys were once Roman citizens, so you guys, you know, not wanting us and, you know, doing all that is kind of like traitor. You guys being kind of traitors, so... Uh. Um, to that end, he ordered that his triumphant army spare the citizens rather than slaying them. He was to be a liberator of these Roman lands rather than a vicious foreign conqueror. News of this angered the soldiers, who were denied their opportunity to sack Tiana. They reminded Aurelian of the pledge he had made, but the emperor was not intimidated, replying that, I did indeed decree that no dog should be allowed to live. Well then, kill all the dogs! The angry soldiers were pleased with the joke, and set about carrying out their ruler's orders with calmed tempers. Such clemency proved to be a wise. Kind of crazy that they had to uh, move into not killing, you know, innocent men, women, and children. Mm. Kind of sad for all the dogs. So, yeah. such clemency proved to be a wise strategy. After Tiana, no city in Asia Minor resisted Aurelian's march, and he emerged from the Cilician Gates into Syria, ready to confront the Palmyrenes in their home territory. Zenobia's greatest general, Zabdus, placed his army in between Aurelian and Antioch. Instead of attacking the great city from the north, where the tactical incentive lay with Zabdus, Aurelian instead shifted his forces to outflank him from the east. Worrying that this would move the clash into unfavorable terrain and onto his own line of retreat, the Palmyrene general sent most of his cavalry to intercept Aurelian on the eastern shores of Lake Antioch. Rather than risking his infantry against Zabdus's cataphracts, the Roman Emperor sent out his horsemen to bait the enemy into a trap. When the Palmyrene heavy cavalry charged, the lighter armoured and armed Roman units fled at the first contact, fleeing several kilometres towards the town of Ime. When the overburdened cataphracts and their horses began to slow down from exhaustion, Aurelian's cavalry turned and countercharged them, scattering the Palmyrene forces winning a decisive victory and allowing the emperor to sit on the enemy's line of retreat. Zenobia and Zabdus's defeat led them to abandon Antioch and retreat south to Emesa, where it is said that 60,000 of Aurelian's men faced 70,000 of Zenobia and Zabdus. 
Aurelian once again tried to lure the Palmarine Cataphractarii into a similar trap, but this time the maneuver went wrong and the Emperor's cavalry caught the brunt of the enemy's charge, resulting in massive losses and a near rout. The veteran legions of Aurelian were still fighting, however, and they managed to break the Palmarine infantry in front of them. On the flanks, Zenobia's cataphracts charged too far and were themselves cut to pieces when the Roman infantry pivoted to the wings and smashed into them. And it kind of makes you wonder like how, uh, how fast the infantry had to run to actually catch up to all that. Uh, like far away. Roman infantry pivoted to the wings and smashed into them. The queen fled Emesa to Palmyra, leaving so quickly that there was not even enough time to transport the treasury away from danger. As the sweltering high summer approached, Aurelian wasted no time and embarked on a grueling march east through the desert, putting the enemy capital under siege, whilst also securing a deal with local Bedouins to receive food. Realizing that her only hope for aid now was a personal appeal to the Sasanian king, Zenobia snuck through the Roman siege lines and attempted to flee into Persian territory on a camel. However, when the alarm was quickly raised, the Palmarine ruler was captured by Aurelian's outriders and brought to the Emperor. The besieged oasis's population was divided, but the Emperor ended any uncertainty by ordering those who wished for peace to come out and surrender. At first, people were slow to do so, but when they witnessed Aurelian's mercy to the initial few, more and more came and submitted, giving him gifts and tribute in return for pardon. Without any further shedding of blood, Aurelian entered the city of Palmyra in total victory. Whilst present there, he trialed and executed some of the main enemy leaders, including Zabdus, imposed a garrison upon the city, and distributed much of its wealth to the soldiers. He also received an ambassador from the Sasanian Empire, who brought the Shah's congratulations on the great victory. His own realm was riven by internal strife and could not risk a war against Aurelian's power even if the prize was such a great one as Palmyra. The Emperor's most treasured prize... So obviously, uh, that was a very smart political um, move by uh, the Sassanian Empire, just knowing that them having internal strife would be easily... I mean, could you imagine Rome and saying they're freaking reach all the way to damn near India? So... Even if the prize was such a great one as Palmyra. The Emperor's most treasured prize was Zenobia herself. She was spared, but suffered the indignity of being paraded through Syria's cities chained to a camel. This, and rumours of her cowardice in the face of defeat, were designed to snuff out any lingering support the Queen may have had. As he marched back to the city of Byzantium, Aurelian assumed the title for which he is most well known, Restitutor Orbis, Restorer of the World. Still, he had much to do. Upon his arrival in Europe, Aurelian crushed yet another barbarian incursion into Mesia, but was then forced to return to Palmyra in early 273 upon receiving intelligence from a loyal subordinate in the area that the city's leaders intended to betray him. For the second time in less than a year, the presumably furious emperor approached Palmyra after a lightning-quick march which took the rebel leaders totally by surprise. There was no time to prepare proper defences and Aurelian took the city swiftly. Again, he showed remarkable restraint in his vengeance. The ringleaders were immediately slain, but the citizens were permitted to leave. The city of Palmyra itself was not so lucky. Aurelian allowed his troops to ravage the troublesome enemy capital. Much of its wealth was plundered, and many of its great structures razed. It has to be the, like, one of the rarest freaking things, though, for... I've never heard of that. Uh, uh of an opposing general letting an entire civilization, or not civilization, the entire city come on, you know, evacuate the city before he raised it. Usually, that those inhabitants get raised right along with the city, so it's pretty crazy to think about that. I guess you can do that when you're an emperor. You know, so. Yeah, becoming yet another irrelevant provincial town on the Roman frontier. Before he returned west, Aurelian had to march on Egypt and subdue a revolt there, securing Rome's grain supplies. With all business in the east taken care of, the emperor and his field army returned to the capital and set about preparing an expedition to finally put an end to the Gallic Empire, which was at that point under the control of Tetricus. 
by the time campaigning of 274 began, all preparations were complete. Aurelian marched across the Alps to his foothold in Gallia Narbonensis, then quickly took Lugdunum. The Gallic Empire was weak, but Tetricus nevertheless rallied his Rhine legions and met Aurelian near Chalon in late February. Historians debate what truly happened, but the contest was decided before the first pillar was thrown. Either Aurelian's superior generalship quickly gained him mastery of the battlefield, or Tetricus made a deal with the emperor to submit before any fighting was necessary. Whatever the case, the splinter empire in Gaul and Britannia was extinguished, its military units were reintegrated into the Roman army, and the empire was whole again for the first time in 14 years. With his victory now total, Aurelian went back to the capital with his spoils in tow and hosted what might have been one of the greatest triumphs in all of Roman history. Coming up first in the procession were vast eastern tribes. Relatively speaking, that happened. He did all this pretty freaking fast. I mean, it's only been for, I want to say, like only a couple of years. It's not only a couple of decades. Treasures gained from the conquest of Palmyra most prominent among the horde being three ornate royal chariots arrayed one behind the other. First among them was a fabulously crafted vehicle, ordained with silver, gold and jewels, which had belonged to Odinathus before his own death years before. The second was an equally masterful creation, a Persian chariot which had been granted to Aurelian as a gift from the Sasanian king. Finally came the true prize, the Palmarine Queen Zenobia herself, riding in a grand chariot that it is said she herself constructed. After the glorious display, vast amounts of exotic animals were exhibited before the awestruck population of Rome, such as elephants, tigers, giraffes and elks. After them came rank upon rank of bound prisoners, prominent men from Palmyra and barbarian tribes in the region, including representations of the mythical Amazons who had been captured during the campaign. From his western conquest, Aurelian's highlight was Tetricus, self-proclaimed emperor, clad in a scarlet imperial cloak, yellow tunic and Gallic trousers. Along with the western usurper was his son, whom the former had acclaimed co-emperor the year before his defeat. When the grand procession came to an end, vast entertainments were held for days afterwards, including theatrical plays, chariot races in the circus, wild beast hunts, gladiator fights, and even a naval battle reenactment. After all of the celebrations were over, Aurelian still could not or would not rest on his laurels. As the fifth year of his reign dawned, the emperor went west to deal with a minor Alemanni invasion, and then marched east into Thrace in the summer. Because 3rd century sources can be somewhat unreliable, it is not agreed as to why Aurelian moved east. However, most historians either believe that the emperor was in the Balkans to deal with a barbarian invasion or to prepare a great offensive against the civil war-ridden Sasanian Empire, whose capture and humiliation of Valerian had not been forgotten. Whatever the case, at some point in the middle of 275, Aurelian encamped at a way station on the road to Byzantium called Cenefurium which was next to the Sea of Marmara. It was to be his final resting place. While he was there, one of Aurelian's administrators of secretaries, a slave or freedman known as Eros, did an unknown deed which would both be inevitably discovered and would inevitably bring the emperor's notorious wrath upon him when it was discovered. To save himself, Eros came up with a desperate solution. Since the bureaucrat was able to imitate Aurelian's writing style, he forged a series of documents accusing many senior army officers of crimes and misdeeds and condemning those same men to death. When Eros showed the men this list, they were terrified and reacted too quickly without thought. A group of desperate conspirators, led by a general known as Mukapor, waited until Aurelian dismissed his bodyguard and then stabbed their emperor to death. Yet the assassination was not a crime of hatred. When the reality of Eros's deceit came to light, the officers who had murdered the emperor were filled with a combination of guilt, grief and fury. It was all directed at the desperate secretary, who the Historia Augusta tells us was tied to a stake and savaged by ravenous wild beasts. 
Just like that, with a crude act of deception, the life of Aurelian came to an end in the middle of 275, only five years after he took the throne. Grief struck the entire empire when it learned of their great emperor's passing. To indicate just what a significant occasion it really was, the senate and the army did not jostle to install the new emperor. Conversely, they even bestowed that right on the other party, aiming to push away the accusation of guilt. Eventually, Aurelian's second-in-command Probus came to the throne, and after a few more tentative years, Diocletian inherited the Roman Empire and ended the crisis years. We will talk about Roman history more in the coming months, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. Alright guys, we'll go ahead and end it right there. So yeah, definitely, uh, definitely sad ending. Um, what an amazing life, an amazing uh, emperor who definitely helped the empire live for obviously another 300 years because without that, who knows, that probably would have, the, you know what I'm saying, the, the taking of Constantinople would have probably happened in a uh, thousand years earlier or something, you know, who knows. But again, thank you guys again for joining me with another episode of Mike's Intellectual Report. And if you guys like it, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you guys again. Join me on another one. I'm out. Peace.